Hello and welcome back to the CCNA journey with me, Ryan. And in this section, we're going to continue with networking fundamentals, particularly around subnetting. And this is the second part of the Q&A. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, connect on LinkedIn, Facebook or follow in, on Twitter. If these videos have been helpful, please do like and subscribe. So let's get started. Okay, first one up then. What is 229 in its binary format? In the last video, we had a binary and we changed it to decimal. In this, we've got a decimal and we're going to change it to binary. And the first thing that we should be doing at this point is writing out the binary conversion chart. Now, if this is something that you've not seen or not familiar with, go back and watch the other videos. And if you are, brilliant. And the way this works is ultimately we need to ask ourselves some simple questions. And those questions are, does, in this case, 229, which is our number, does 128 fit into 229? Now, if it does, the answer is yes, we give it a 1. If the answer is no, we give it a 0. It's probably best I don't put rings around them. Like so. Now, in this case, we know that 128 fits into 229. So we're going to put a 1 there. And since we've put 1 there, what we have to do now is take away 128 from 229. So what we're going to do there is simple maths. Take away 128 from 229, and we're left with 101. Now, we move to the next number. And again, does 64 fit into 101? Yes, it does. And now we need to get 101 and take away 64. And that is 37. And then we're using the next number. Does 32 fit into 37? Yes, it does. Okay, let's get 37. Let's take away 32. We're left with 5. Now this is where it changes. Does 16 fit into 5? No. Does 8 fit into 5? No. Does 4 fit into 5? Yes. Okay, good. So let's get 5, take away 4. We're left with 1. Does um, 2 fit into 1? No. Does 1 fit into 1? Yes. So what we're left with is 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Which means answer E is correct. So as you can see, following the chart, the actual binary conversion chart, is very simple to take binary and put it in, sorry, take decimal and put it into binary and binary into decimal using this chart. Like I said also in the last video, we've done the opposite. We had a binary number and we change it to decimal. In this, we've got a decimal number and we change it to binary. Make sure that you're comfortable with that and understanding why this chart's needed. The more time you spend understanding binary decimal and decimal to binary, it just helps with understanding things like access control lists, wildcards, and all sorts of uh, subnetting questions that become more and more complex as you move up in your career. So spend a bit of time, make sure you understand it. And there's also a few games you can play online to keep your binary skills to the level it should be. Hopefully you got that one right. Let's move on to the next question. A bit more tricky. How many IPs are in a slash 28? And it says here, show your workings. So make sure you pause the video and work it out now. And when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over it together. Now, obviously, this is how I would work it out. Uh, I would sort of take shortcuts. And considering this is obviously the second part of the Q&A and you've already watched three videos on subnetting and no doubt read a lot about it, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. And the way I work this out, first of all, is I look at this and I know that that is the CIDR notation, which is the classless interdomain routing. I know in total that there can only ever be 32 bits. And I know that 28 bits represent the network, which means that there must be only four bits left, which represents the host. And what I then do is add the formula of two to the power of n minus two, where n is now four. And I ultimately go two, four, eight, 16, take away two, 14. So I would say that how many IPs are in a slash 28 subnet? I would say there are 16 IPs with 14 usable because we have to take away the two addresses because of the network and 
broadcast address. That's how I work it out. Obviously, everyone will do it differently, but ultimately, it's two to the power of how many bits are turned off, minus two. However you got to that same answer, well, however you got to the answer may be different, ultimately, long as it's the same answer. So this one's going to be a bit more tricky. We're being asked, what is the fifth usable IP range of 192.168.00/24 when it's subnetted into multiple slash 30s? So first of all, 192.168.00/24 tells us that these bits here, so the first 24 bits, which happen to be the first three octets, we don't touch they all must remain the same. And the reason for that is because we can't go any lower than the range that we were given. We only can go higher. So instantly, all of these ones, like for example, B must be wrong, uh, and C must be wrong, and E must be wrong, and F must be wrong. Because what we can't do here is we can't change this third octet because the third octet is lower, as in a lower number, than 24 bits. And we're not allowed to change that. When we're subnetting, we're subnetting this slash 24 into smaller networks. And in this case, we've been asked to subnet it into slash 30s. And we also know straight away by looking at this one that they've asked for the fifth usable IP range and this top one will be the first usable IP range. So within a couple of seconds, you should instantly be able to identify that the question or the answer is D. And you could get that without even doing the subnetting itself. So hopefully some of you may have got onto that and got the answer straight away. However, some of you may have obviously gone ahead and done the actual calculation and subnetting before applying that sort of logic to the questions and answers, and that's fine. But of course, the reason I've done this is to show you that sometimes you don't need to get, uh, you know, sometimes you don't have to subnet the entire network range in order to find out what the answer will be to the question. But nonetheless, let's go over and find out what it would be. So we know now that we can't touch the first three octets. So all of the action happens in the fourth octet. And we also know that they want it subnetted into multiple slash 30s. Well, at the moment, it's a slash 24, meaning that we got obviously all ones. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And since they want slash thirties, what we have to do is continue with our ones until we reach the top. Because at the moment we've got 24 bits turned on and we need 30 turned on in total. So that's 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, which leaves us two bits turned off. And what I will do now is I'm going to do two to the power of N. And that tells us how big this host portion is, which is course four, because it goes to four. And we can also do two to the power of how many bits that I've turned off. Well, so, sorry, two to the bit, two to the power of how many bits I've just turned on, which is two, four, eight, 16, 32. And the reason those two numbers are important is because this tells us there are going to be 32 network ranges, all of which have a total of four addresses. And of course, in a slash 30, there are four addresses to usable. So we now know there's 32 addresses and we know there's gonna be four IPs in each address. We need to write out the address range because we're looking for the fifth one. So it starts with 192.168.00. And that would be a slash 30, 192, 192, Notice that, like I said, these 24 bits, sorry, yes, these 24 bits don't change at all. It's only the last octet. And what we're doing on the last octet is we're just simply adding four to the number each time until we get 
to the fifth usable IP range. And if we do the maths now, this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So the actual answer is 192.168.0.16 slash 30 because it's one range, two range, three, four, five. This is the fifth range. When we take that 24, we break it into slash 30s, which are four IPs per subnet, which gives us the total of 32 subnets inside that 24. And the fifth one down, when we start breaking them up, is that 192.168.0.16 slash 30. So that's the actual answer, which means, of course, that our actual real answer is D because the fifth subnet is not listed here as we've just calculated. Okay, that's all we've got time for in this lesson. Hopefully that's been informative. The uh, lesson primarily talked about subnetting again. So this was the second Q&A that we have for the CCNA track. And it's the fourth video that I talk about IPv4 and subnetting in general. So hopefully that's enough information along with your books in order to understand subnetting in enough detail to pass the CCNA. I'm sure it is. Um, in the next couple of videos, we're going to talk about the different types of addressing, like private versus public addressing, because that's very important to understand also. Um, but um, yeah, with subnetting, I don't want to take too much of your time up because it's not exactly a fun topic. Most people tend to hate it. In fact, uh, I think it, once you learn subnet in a bit more depth and you become more familiar with it, people tend to like it more often. So the more you do it, the more you like it. I can promise that. But nonetheless, it's really useful to understand. And the more you learn now at this level, the more it will pay dividends later when you're going for your CCMP and CCIE topics. I hope this video has been informative. I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.